Spirit. Here again, words written for us in John chapter 1. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Come and see, Philip told him. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Truly here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, while you were under the fig tree, I saw you. You may be seated. My dear Christian friends, you got to see this. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Hurry, hurry. He grabbed his brother's arm and started dragging him in the direction he wanted him to go. Calm down. I'm coming, all right? He was already preparing for disappointment because little brothers are always far too excitable. But there was a chance there was just a little bit of a chance that maybe the little punk did find something that was worth seeing. And anyways, he wasn't going to leave him alone until he went and went to see. And so he went. When they came up over that hill, he was stunned. The picturesque scene seemed to have been plucked right out of a storybook. He looked at his little brother and he smiled. This was a place that two brothers could have adventures all summer long. You gotta see this. In our digital age, with all of its clickbait headlines, we almost never have things you gotta see. We are constantly bombarded by new and important things that you gotta see. And I can't remember the last time I was as impressed as the person who told me, you have to see this. You gotta see it. Really? Do I? However, if you travel around this beautiful state from Multnomah Falls to Thor's Well to Crater Lake if, and so many more places, if you keep your mind open and your eyes open, if you can avoid that cynical boredom that afflicts our own time, you might be surprised how often you are glad you went when someone said, come and see. Philip met Jesus, and he knew exactly what he had to do. He grabbed his friend Nathaniel and said, You gotta see this! Come and see! And his excitement is palpable even today. Everyone needs to hear these words, Come and see! Today, we get dragged along as he beckons us, Come and see! Come and see the one who who sees you. Come and see greater things than that. About 43 days have passed since last Sunday. And after this last week, it almost feels that way, doesn't it? Well, Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River, and immediately he was sent out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. During that time, John continued baptizing. The leaders in Jerusalem took notice and they sent their disciples, their minions, to go check this John guy out. And John told them, the one coming after me is greater than me. His, the thongs of his straps of his sandals, I'm not even worthy to untie. And then the very next day, Jesus returned. John pointed at him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Then he recalled what he saw when Jesus was baptized, how the heavens had opened, and the Spirit gave his testimony. This is the Son of God, John said. And the day after that, the baptizer was standing with two of his disciples, Andrew and, we presume, John, who wrote this gospel. And he told them again, look, the Lamb of God. And those two immediately starting, started following Jesus. They spent that day with him. Andrew went and found his brother. You've probably heard of Simon, who Jesus renamed Peter. In 42 days of public ministry, Jesus had a whopping three followers. He was hardly going viral as the Christ. The next day, Jesus was going to leave for Galilee. But before he left, he found Philip. And he told Philip, follow me. Philip did as the Lord asked. He knew Andrew and Peter, probably John too, he heard what John the Baptist had said about Jesus, and so he knew this is the one, the Messiah, for whom we have been waiting all of these years. But Philip knew he couldn't keep this information to himself. He went and found Nathanael, and he told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I would love to know more about Nathaniel. He seems, from what we know about him, he seems to have been perhaps a bit of a geek. Perhaps he was up on all the theories of the Messiah. He kept track of the rumors. He developed his own theories. If he lived today, he would have had his own blog. And then he would have upgraded to a podcast. Like all those people who keep track of all of the trade rumors or can talk about all the different ins and outs of politics or true crime or whatever it is that they are obsessed with, Nathaniel must have known about the prophecies of the Messiah in and out. He was interested in all things Messiah. And so Philip knew Nathaniel has to meet Jesus. And he went to tell him that, but the story didn't add up. Even with Philip and Andrew and Peter all saying we have found the Christ, it didn't make any sense. Nazareth? Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Can you name one important thing that has ever happened in Nazareth? Do you think the chief priests, the scribes, any of our rulers are talking about Nazareth? I wonder if some of them could even find it on a map. There's nothing noble about Nazareth. You've got to be kidding me. There's no way. It doesn't add up. Nazareth isn't even on the draft board. You can't say it. Can anything good come from there? Did Philip sigh out loud at this? It was probably exactly what he expected from someone like Nathaniel. Before you say another word, just come and see. This excuse, it shouldn't work anymore. Nothing has been more responsible for more human flourishing in all of history than Christianity. All the best of modern philosophy, the beginning, the roots of the modern scientific method, and all of the foundation on which our modern science are built, they come from Christian assumptions. The most beautiful art, Christian. The richest, best, most beautiful music, Christian. Purpose for the good times in life. Strength and encouragement in the worst times of life. 
we can demonstrably show that these are all found in Christ. No one should be able to use this excuse. And yet, people still do. The cynical heart hears the name Jesus and scoffs. It considers religion and churches and sneers. Can anything good come from there? And perhaps this is our own fault. As the church grows more comfortable with the world and in the world, it often becomes less about Christ. As Christians obsess over politics, Christ takes a back seat. As we engage in all these little arguments, thinking we have to defend every little detail or talk about all these different parts of the Bible and its teachings, we often find ourselves talking less about Christ. If we tell people they have to come and see our worship, come and join our programs, come and find our guide to a better life, or if we are all about our own opinions and how to make sure those are seen and we can show why our opinions are right by finding the right Bible passage besides, when you pack all of that into our churches, well, there's not much room for Christ anymore. Nathaniel had a real objection to Philip's invitation. But notice, Philip didn't even bother answering it. He didn't have to answer the objection because Philip had Jesus. And so he simply said, come and see. Because Jesus cannot be ignored. Jesus can never be dismissed. You can't see Jesus, meet Jesus, listen to what Jesus has spoken and say, eh, what's the big deal? Jesus speaks for himself. Come and see. Nathaniel could hardly argue. He didn't have much to lose, and he had everything to gain. But he never anticipated what awaited him. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him, and he said about him, Truly here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Although Jesus and Nathanael have never met before, Jesus is genuinely happy to see him. A man who is honest, genuine, and without any hidden agenda, he will fit right in with the Lord, Jesus says. But Nathanael is shocked. How do you know me? Even though they're complimentary, these words are quite troubling. When this man can know nothing about him. It leaves Nathaniel feeling a little exposed. You see, he was going to see Jesus, but he had never felt more seen. She didn't know what she wanted. The new seating chart had her sitting right next to to her crush. And part of her wanted to be invisible. She looked in the mirror that morning and she was convinced that that is the biggest pimple that has ever been on anybody's face. She didn't want him to see her. She didn't know what she would say. What if she said something stupid and he thought she was an idiot? What if he laughed at her? She wanted to be invisible. At the same time, how he, she wanted him to notice her. Maybe he would see how cute she is. Maybe he would be impressed by her intelligence. Maybe he would laugh at a witty joke she would tell. Maybe he would notice her great kindness and compassion. At the same time, she wished she could be completely invisible, but she was terrified she might actually be. Nathaniel learned you can't be invisible to Jesus. Before Philip called you, while you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. How terrifying those words must have been. 
We don't know what was significant about Nathaniel's time under the fig tree. Was he reading something, thinking about something, praying about something? Was there a great concern weighing on his heart? But Jesus saw him. The thought had to go through Nathaniel's mind. If Jesus saw me there, what else has Jesus seen? How could he not know what Nathaniel said to Philip? How would he not know the doubts and fears lurking in his heart? How could he not know all of Nathaniel's weaknesses? If Jesus saw Nathaniel, even in a seemingly insignificant moment, like while he was sitting under a fig tree, what moment, what sin, what stupid thing was unknown to this man who was standing in front of him? My friends, the same is true for us. You can't be invisible to Jesus. How exposed that leaves you. Who would want that kind of attention? I don't want my weaknesses known to anybody. I want my weaknesses to be invisible. I want my stupid thoughts to remain in my head where no one has to know I even thought them. Yet, whenever you open the scriptures, your sins are all laid out there. You read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and he strips away all the things we like, all the righteousness we like to hide ourselves behind. He sees me. I have nowhere to hide my worst. He sees you. You are exposed under his gaze. Many like to avoid church and this is why. They feel like if they were to enter there, they would be under the gaze of God. But God sees them whether they enter a building or not. We often are timid in confessing our faith, in confessing our sins, in acknowledging what we have done, as if speaking that sin out loud will somehow make it real, somehow make it known, visible. But Jesus, Jesus already sees. All the while, Jesus sees you. But Jesus doesn't mention any of that. He doesn't mock Nathaniel's doubts. He doesn't rebuke Nathaniel's foolish words to Philip. He chose instead to see Nathaniel's faith, saying, Here is one waiting for the Messiah. Here is a man of faith. Jesus saw Nathaniel and he saw a disciple, he saw an apostle. He saw God's unique creation. He saw what God had prepared Nathanael to be, what Nathanael would be by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come and see this Jesus, the Jesus who sees you. Jesus sees you to forgive all your sins, those you feel on your heart, those you try to hide, and those you don't even know. Jesus sees you. Jesus sees your wants. Jesus sees your needs. He sees your struggles. He sees your weaknesses. He sees your doubts and he sees your fears. He sees you to comfort you and encourage you. He sees you so that he may carry you through your worst. Jesus sees you to strengthen you, to build you up, to fill you, to give you all you need so that you can be your best because Jesus sees you for an eternal purpose. Jesus sees you. He sees you as a unique creation of God. Someone God has given unique gifts that he will use in this world. He sees you as someone in whom he will display his glory. He sees you as someone he can accomplish great things through. Come and see the one who sees you. Moses and all the prophets spoke about him. Come and see him who saves you. The moment Nathanael was seen by the Lord, his faith immediately blossomed into joy and wonder. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. 
And Jesus accepted his praise and then used the moment to teach his disciples about his greater purpose. Amen. Or he said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Amen, amen, I tell you. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. When Jacob was at his lowest, he deceived his father, he robbed his brother, he fled for his life going to his uncle who lived hundreds and hundreds of miles away. When Jacob was alone in the field with a rock as a pillow under his head, Heaven opened in front of him and a stairway appeared with the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. God repeated the promise of salvation to Jacob. Heaven's power would come down and ensure that all of God's promises would come true. In that difficult time, God showed Jacob he still had access to the Lord. For the next three years, Nathanael would see this truth again and again. In Jesus, God's power to save had come to earth. In Jesus, he would see disease healed in front of him. Jesus would speak with authority. Jesus would drive out the demons and command them to be silent. He would comfort. He would forgive. He would teach them to pray with the promise, whatever you ask in my name, my Father in heaven will give it to you. You will see greater things than this, Jesus said. Nathaniel, you will see what it means to have full access to God through me. You've got to see this. We live in a cynical and doubt-filled world. We begin to think that there is nothing that we really gotta see. But Jesus says, come and see. On every page of the Gospels, Jesus continues to do greater and greater things. Come and see. Every Sunday we follow him. We see his work. We follow his life. This season of Epiphany, we reve- Jesus reveals his glory to us so that we can see who he is and see what he has come to do. It prepares us for that journey to Calvary that we take in Lent. Come and see. His greatness cannot be exaggerated. God's Son, the King of Israel, comes to open heaven and give you life. He gives you full access to God. Though our sins have separated us from God, as he is lifted up on the cross, heaven comes down to greet you. In Jesus, your prayers ascend to heaven. In Jesus, the angels come down to serve you. In Jesus, God's favor smiles upon you. Jesus ensures that all of God's promises are true for you and not one of them will fail. What greater thing do we have to see? Come and see. And as Jesus tells us to follow him, he sends us out with that same invitation. Because Jesus sees those people all around us. He is what they all have to see. Because they need to see him in this life to see his love, to see his grace, to see his power to save, to see that they too can have access to God the Father through him. We need to see him now because in the end, all will see him. And how we can rejoice when we see him again because you will live in his glory with full access to God forever. Amen. Please rise. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We join now in confessing our common.